so, hello, my name's Chris. I'm Abiron, A-B-E-I-R-O-N on IRC. I work for a wonderful company called Shadowcat, and I'm here to talk to you about doing Unix programming with Perl, something that I've seen has been in a decline, unfortunately, recently. So, uh, first off, I want to say that the code that I'm showing here is for illustration purposes. Sorry. Yeah. Right. So, as I was saying, um, the code here is not what I would write for a client. It is not what I would write on my own, but rather it is simplified at a lower level for the purpose of demonstration. I'll probably use something a little higher level for this. And as just a what this covers is a very simple HTTP server, because HTTP is relatively common and understood. People like to have give talks on how to do HTTP servers. So if, if you know you use the web at all, then you know what it's going to be doing. Okay, so how many of you have written any kind of Unix code, forks, sockets, that kind of thing in C? In C, or, or something other, something other than Perl. Okay, very nice. This will be new to a lot of people. Good. Okay. Uh, review of concepts. Let's see here. Okay. Uh, how many people? Who, how many people here know what a socket is? Doesn't matter what kind. Okay. How about Unix sockets? Okay. Um, do one another review then. Socket is basically a way to have two processes talk to one another. It's very simple. Very general. This. You have a socket, any kind, Unix or Internet. You have another program connected with it, and exchange data. Good. Of course, there's BGP, but never mind. So you have two different kinds of sockets. I'm going to be demonstrating both of them in this talk. Uh, the first kind we're familiar with, and you're probably using right now, is an Internet socket, which is TCP, IP, web, email, that kind of thing. There is also a Unix socket, which is a neat little invention that I believe came into Unix before it went to Berkeley. If I'm wrong, please correct me. And a Unix socket will do essentially the same thing as an internet socket, except it exists on the file system. So there are some pros and cons with existing on the file system. You have access control via Unix permissions, which is good but it's local to that machine. So if you want to communicate just one machine, different processes on that machine, you can use a Unix socket. This is typically used for programs like Tmux, or Screen, or XMMS, etc., etc., that kind of thing, for doing communication with a client program. So you're not talking about things like slash dev modem is a file. You're not, you're not talking about that, are you? are you? No, but Unix sockets are files on the file system. If you've used syslog, if you have a Unix system, you've used syslog. Syslog communicates over a Unix socket dev log. General, of course, you can complicate that, but general by default is dev log. So they're pretty familiar if you know what to look for. Um, Okay, so there you go. Uh, that is a Unix socket using GNU LS. You'll see that it has the S in the long format, so you know that it's a socket. Just showing that that's how you identify it. It's also colored. Now I'm not sure yet. Yeah, good, good. Also a nice little uh, color there so you can tell what it is. Okay. Okay, sockets. Okay, for you. Now, uh, when you're reading from a socket, you generally need to either loop the program over a read loop, which waits for data to come in and then reads it. Or you can have the kernel tell you when there's data available on the socket in a dozen different ways. There's select, poll, epoll, I notify, kq, etc. etc. Et there's a dozen different ways to do this I can think of. But what we're going to be covering here is select because it's very basic, very traditional. So what select does is uh, 
Okay, so you have a couple file descriptors, and you add them to a select object. And back in C, you would do this via vectors of all well, you, you would do this via bitmaps of file descriptors, bitmasks. And what select does is when you call it, it returns the file descriptors that are ready for reading, or writing, or that have an error condition. So here, uh, what the code is doing is adding the control socket, which is here. The control socket, which I'm going to be using for stats and config reloading and that kind of thing. And the internet socket, which, gas serves the HTTP connections. So then down here we have those to the reading. And then we have a loop here. The important thing is that this is not a busy wait loop in that it is not going to just sit and eat the CPU while it's waiting for connections to come in. It will instead wait for the can read method of the select object to return. Do I skip anything that's confusing anyone so far? No? Everyone following? <coughs> Around a bit. So then we get some file descriptors in the ready array. And so then, of course, we need to know what is ready for us. So we look over that, we accept the client from the socket. The important distinction here, rather, the important lack of distinction here, is that you can call accept on both the Unix socket and the Unix socket. They work more or less the same because down at the C level they are the same. So when we have a connection coming in, in increment the connection count for the application. This is just so you know how many people, people have connected to it. Uh, fork off to handle the client. Now fork, I just briefly covered that. Um, Probably should cover it in depth now. Uh, four, yes. Cornerstone of Unix programming. Has anyone actually used fork C for all anything? Yes, good. Okay. For those who have not, <coughs> fork will clone the process. That's what we call it. And the way it's implemented is rather elegant. And sorry, did I someone have a question? I thought I heard something. Okay. Okay. Um, as I was saying, fork will clone the process. That's the point you call it. And the interesting thing is <coughs> the return value. The return value is sort of an in-band error checking, as well as useful information. And what I mean by that is that if fork returns an undeath in curl or a negative one in C other places. That means that you can't you fail to create another process. And the interesting thing here is that a negative value or an undeath is not process ID. And when you call for when it returns an parent, you get the process ID of the child, which is going to be a positive integer. And when you're in the child, you get zero. Because you can get your own PID from get PID and other stuff like that. So if you have a zero, which is not a valid process ID, then you know you're in the client. If you have a positive integer, then you know you're in the parent and the fork succeeded. If you have something else, then you have a problem. And if you can't fork, you have a big problem. So, assuming we fork, we don't do anything in the parent because we're reading the file descriptors. If we're in the child, as I said, we will check to see which file handle we have calling some stuff that are defined further down. Uh, if fork failed, we call syslog. And we die with the error method because if we can't create the process, there's something very seriously wrong with the system. Uh, moving down a bit to our handler subs. 
this is the Unix socket handle sub. You get the client at the pass as the first argument. Try to read a line. Now, those of you who are a little experienced with doing Unix programming will recognize that I could have used a select loop here as well. But I wanted to demonstrate another way to do blocking I.O. So we set up an alarm <coughs> alarm block rather. So what alarm does, the call that I make down here, is it will set, will tell the kernel to deliver the alarm signal to the calling process after the number of seconds given as the argument. So we have 10 seconds here, which means we're going to be given the alarm signal 10 seconds after that line of executing. So, how does this help us? Okay. The next line is trying to read the line from the client. So if that doesn't come in after 10 seconds, the alarm will go off. So if the client is not going to respond to us, not going to give us any data after 10 seconds, over a local Unix socket, so network latency and such are not an issue, then we may as well disconnect them. Because if they're not going to talk to us after 10 seconds, they're probably not going to talk to us at all. So then what happens is the signal handler for the alarm loop set by calling, set by writing the alarm key of the global SIG hash. We set it to a subref of eight of year. This just exits the eval loop. Of course, if you die in an eval, Exit the email, that's how a basic accept and handling control works. So if we do die, then we have an exception, which is written to dollar hat. Then we know that the client didn't give us any data in time. So we handle that. Allow the debug message, probably because we have a buggy Unix socket client. And we want the admin reading the log to be able to tell the developer, hey, fix your code, please. So then after we do that, we close the client because presumably we're not going to get any data from them. Otherwise, if we do exit the eval loop without the alarm being called, then we have some data. Okay, good. Uh, new line. Then uh, we do some processing over the line. Anyone here not use given when in 5.10? <laughs> mm. Okay, so presuming you're familiar with that, uh, it just checks the variable against the things that we're providing here. Uh, it can do a status request, which gives a dump of the stats hash, which contains the connection request, the number of connections, the time the server was started to determine its uptime, and the number of bytes sent. Uh, if you do a reload, there's a bit of a classic Unix system here. Reloading the configuration file without restarting, which is the enemy of Windows programmers everywhere. Or if they give us some garbage that we don't recognize, log a notice to the syslogs, the admin can say, fix your code, please. And uh, tell the client that we don't know what they want us to do. So that presumably the developer who didn't handle that case will get an exception in their code so they can say, oh, I'm an idiot, and fix our code. Hopefully. So. Uh, moving down to the internet request, which is just basic HTTP handling. There's the eval loop to get a line from the client. Now this is probably a lot less than your standard Apache <coughs> like you will wait. 60 seconds is not long at all, but it is here to illustrate the concept. So, the same sort of thing, timeout, the log and such, make sure that you're differentiating that it's an HTTP log and such. Okay, now since I'm lazy, I don't want to process raw HTTP myself. So I pull in some libraries and have that do the work for me. Of course, this is assuming that we get one whole line all at once. Processing and assembling a 
mutual fear request by reading individual bites over a period of time left as an exercise for the reader. So, we get the HTTP request all for the clients. We generate a new response object. Get the URI for the request, the path that you're requesting. Then we try to see if it exists on the file system. The file spec line here is a very basic paradigm that you're probably familiar with from Apache or any other web server. You can concatenate the doc root with the request. If it exists, good. If not, well, 404. So, if the file does exist, uh, we want to do some basic HTTP things. Set the response code, set the, the response message, read the file with the file sub, read file sub, uh, set the response content to the body of the file, obviously, increment the stats, send the data to the client, log it to 100 OK, and that's it. Otherwise, if it doesn't exist, uh, send it to NARF 404. You know, log that does exist. And exit from the client. Well, exit from the fork, rather. I skipped a few things. So, config general. This is the config file format. It's very familiar to anyone who's done any kind of setup for pretty much any sort of game. So, okay, so, before we even do any of that, what I just told you about, read the configs, so we know what the awkward is, uh, and all of this stuff, so. So we just have a docker there. This is a very simple web server, and that's really all it needs to demonstrate the point. Simple docker. So that's down here. So that the config reading just reads in the file with config general, which is very nice. Processes the config file. It's a lot more it does a lot more things than what I showed. But of course, simplicity wins the day, so. And of course, you want to log that you're reading the config to help the developer debug the program when it doesn't want to start for whatever other reasons. It ports in use, or the config file is not found, or doesn't have permission to read the config, or that kind of thing. So, back here. Set up some signal handlers. Okay. As you can see here, there's the stats hash, which logs a bunch of different things that are useful. Apache has a scoreboard type thing, that's what they call it, which does essentially the same thing, but with a lot more detail. It's Apache. A lot more mature than this. We're going to act together in more. Okay, and another classic bit of Unix a bit file. This is very basic bit file handling. There are bit file modules on CPN, but this is very simple. And it actually works. So, demonstrating the concept. Uh, first, before we even start doing anything useful, read, try to read the bit file if it already exists. If it already exists, then get rid of the new one. And we try to send signal zero to the process. Signal zero is special in Unix in that it doesn't actually send the message to the process, but rather is used by the kernel to determine whether the process ID given exists and belongs to the user. And that is column code, of course. So, what this means is if we get a positive return value <coughs> from kill zero on that PID from the bit file, then the process is already running. If the process is already running, then for this simple web server, we don't want to start again. So if the web server is already running, presumably no one changed the file or the PID isn't reused, 
then the server's already running, so we don't do anything in the exit. With a nice handy little message saying, oh, well, we might be you're running. So, good enough, right? signals that we are actually going to handle, the converse of kill. When you run kill on a process, it gets signal handlers. Well, it gets a signal when it handles a signal. This is how you do signal handling in curl. You can do one of a few things. Uh, the hang-up signal, because demons, uh, hang-up is the signal given to a process when it loses its terminal. What this means is it references the old days back in Unix when you dial up to a system or you would have a, a physical console connected to the system. And I see from the gentleman talking there, he knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> you have a big, well, big, not big, but mm, a box with the screen and be connected to a serial connection to be the, the, the size of the screen. And if that cable came disconnected or something, you would get a hang-up signal. Now, the thing is, demons, this is a demon here, they dissociate themselves from the terminal. What that means is that they don't have a terminal associated with them. It's, some, it's just, <laughs> it's, it's a little complicated. It's beyond the scope of this discussion. I'm not going to do this anyway. So they don't have a terminal associated with them. And what that means is that the hang-up signal doesn't have meaning for a, a process without a terminal. A lot of things you're seeing here are defined such that if something doesn't have meaning, then it's reused for something else. For example, a negative PID from fork doesn't have meaning because you can't have a negative process ID. So it means there's an error. Or a zero means you're in a client, that sort of thing. So, hang up, as I was saying, doesn't have meaning for a server. So we use that for something common, like rereading a config file. And if you've ever run run kill hub uh, server, you'll probably note that it will reread its config file. SSHD, Apache, a lot of different servers do that. So, we do the same thing here. This, something not most servers do, they tend to issue this because they figure the socket is just in error. Before we start, we remove the control socket if it already exists. And we do this because this server is sloppy as you know, for itself. You clean it up before itself, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, okay. I haven't really covered syslog except mentioning that it's a good idea and that it's a dev log socket. So when you have a daemon and you don't have a console to print to, and beyond was a console might have been disconnected, you know, because it's been the serial cables being pulled out or your secure shell connection dropped off or whatever. You need a place to send information for debugging, for general info, tell the system that it can't for the process it probably is dying. So you use the good old Unix standby of syslog. For uh, Perl, you use the sys syslog model for this. Generally, very simple. You open the log, you give it the give it the name of the thing you want to log under here. We just use the name of the executable. <coughs> and here, what I'm saying is that the second argument here indicates that I want the process ID appended to every log entry. Beyond after that, there is the daemon, which is the facility for the logs. There's a bunch of different facilities, like daemon, emergency, critical, that kind of thing. Your syslog and page will tell you more. So we do that. Open the syslog and then later. 
like here, we write it. You know, very basic sort of thing. So that's maybe interesting, maybe not. But what good is code without a live demo, huh? Okay, so we have an index of HTML in there. Which is just very, very simple, you know, I'm not a front-end designer. I happen to work with people who are very good with design. So, so we start a server. See, when I try to start it again, when it's already running, it says, hey, stupid, you already have me running. What's wrong with you? So. I believe that's it. Are there any particular questions? Anything that I can clarify, go over in more depth? Anything that I went by quickly? Anything that I confused you with because I'm going kind of out of order? Anything like that?
how you do Unity stuff with Perl. I do hardly recommend that you go and read CPM and do it yourself. Did you go Yes. Did you go over? Yes. Did you go over uh, foreground versus background type stuff? Okay. Uh, Kevin brings up a good point. There's um, when you're running a server, running anything on Unix, you can have it be running in the foreground, which means that it has foreground application is. I'm sorry? You can see it running. Well, you can do that in the background too. Yeah, but on the current screen. Well, not really. Anyway, okay, so foreground application has control over the input and output of the shell, of the terminal. Sorry. And it doesn't dissociate itself from the control. Well, terminal. well if you do control Z, it does background. Well, control Z, but then it's you. background. <coughs> it's not. Right, but that means that you don't have the input and output of the terminal going to the program. And anyway, when you dissociate from the terminal, that's irrelevant. I left that out here, but it's very simple. Perl dot dash Q demon. You can do that. Um, before I forget, I will have the code up for this on GitHub or Shadowcake okay, somewhere. And I will make a mention on IRC or such. And or possibly have Chris uh, point me to it so you can get and find bugs and embarrass me. Any other questions? Bugs? Comments? No. Okay. Well, that's it. Okay. Here's something. Any modules that I've used at the top that you're unfamiliar with, have you used yourself? Yes. I will select. Okay. All right. That's probably the coarsest Unix bit of how this works. So what select does, now that I'm thinking about it, I did skip over it. When you call select in C, you give it a vector, a collection of vectors of file descriptors, which means a, an integer array, a big vector of integers, something like that. Anyway, in Pro, uh, as I said, Okay. Ooh, ooh. So we create the new select object and we add some sockets to it. Well, we add some file descriptors to it. Something that I, I keep tripping up over myself here is confusing sockets and file descriptors. Something very basic to how Unix works is that sockets, like an internet socket or a Unix socket, is very much the same thing as a file handle, because it is a file handle. So you can treat them much the same way. Anyhow, we add some, we add the control socket, the unit socket, and the internet socket to the select object. Now, what do we do with the form? The IO select object has a can read method. And this basically does the equivalent of calling the underlying C select call on the file handles you've passed in before. So that it will block until it gets something to do. An important thing here is that different from regular on disk files, socket descriptors will return a ready state we need to read from them when a client has connected before it sent data. So what this means is that if you get a socket, a new socket, that is ready, you have a client connected to it. And you get the ready state for that file script, for that socket. Then you can then you'll get that socket back from the can read call. And you can call accept on it from there. Therefore, you will know that the select loop, whether you have a new client coming in, and whether you have new data. Of course, I just fork off a new process and call a sub to handle the individual clients. I don't do HTTP pipelining right here. 
So it's simple get and such or one line request and that closes the connection. If I was doing pipelining, I would want definitely want a select or something like that. So I could handle more than one line of item. You can give uh, can read a timeout, which will basically do something like the alarm loops, the, the alarm blocks that I showed you previously, wherein if you don't get anything on the VOD scripters in a given time, it will return. And then you will be able to inspect the return <coughs> for whatever you have. If you have nothing, then you read timed out. Is that clear? Is that uh, understandable? Did I miss anything? Somebody as, you know. No? So basically, it's literally you. It's, you give it a bunch of sockets, you can select from. Well, it, it, the important thing is that it waits until it has some kind of activity that we care about, and then it returns right. that list of sockets that we care about in whatever state it is. Okay, so we have can read. <coughs> it's also can write and has exception. The important thing here is that sockets, file scripters can have something except for how to do like the client unexpectedly closing the connection or maybe the file was closed for whatever reason, say an NFS server fell over or something like that, or the disk crashed, <coughs> something like that, and then you have an exception on the file handle. Alternately, when you're writing a file or a socket, particularly a socket, something over the network, you cannot just write everything all at once. We, we do not have that kind of fast networking that we can just write and write and write and write and write as fast as we can. You have to wait until the other side has read the buffer and the kernel can put more data onto the handle before you can write. So you can call can write on the select object to determine when you can push data as well as <coughs> so a few different methods that you have there. So and of course as I was talking about before the core well the C select or the core product <coughs> function takes a bit string. So the bits method of the select object returns that, so you can go lower level than this. But that's not what I'm covering, that's a little beyond what I'm talking about. So feel free to look at the manual. It's all very well documented. This kind of thing is probably 30, 40 years old, so it's been around. So people generally know what they're doing. None of the ducks. Anything else? Yes. What about a. Uh does this kind of handle like you would, uh, you're writing to a file, you obviously have like file locking, file uh, lock types. Uh, if you're writing to a uh, socket, how does it, does this deal with that? Or is that? Locking on a socket? I'm not sure. No, not locking, but um, I mean, multiple, multiple clients trying to use the same socket. Basically, well, it's having something that at this point to point, so there's no uh, no way for a third party. Can you clarify, please? Uh, no, I can email it. Okay. All right. Very good. Is your um, sample program is that safe if you log out? Would that say running, or would that terminate it from running? Do you have it? Uh, this very simple example does it dissociate itself from the controlling process? So it, if you don't background it. When you just close your terminal or whatever, it will exit. It's a lot of terminal. And is background even enough to keep it running, or would that terminate with your user You session? generally want to know up it, N-O-H-U-P, which is another core basic community thing. And if you do that, it should survive pretty much anything you do to it. The know up program basically runs the program, runs the given Client program 
in such a way that it ignores the lost terminal hang up signal that I was on the before. It's generally a, a very simple, dirty, don't do this in a real production environment kind of way to make a team out of something. But don't. <laughs> there's, there's better ways, like the D9 program and the demon tools and whatever. And such that has its idea. This stuff is very classical, so there's six dozen different ways to do it. Any other questions? No? No? Okay. I believe that is it then. Thank you very much. Hopefully I didn't bore everyone too horribly.